Over the past decade, we've sailed to so many countries and we've had really amazing experiences and some that... Hey, give me nothing, give me that stuff, man. Oh, do not give me my friend. Oh, the adrenaline's pumping so hard. One of the topics that keeps coming up is piracy in our community and online. After that incident in the Seychelles where those guys came aboard, I gave some pause and thought of what I would have liked to have had in hand. Something you can fight back with. Handheld flare, which... Close combat flare. When you have a banker with 15 guys coming up to you, you might want to bring out the right can of mace. Guns are complicated. Like if I look out there, it's pitch black. Yeah, they can see everything inside. If you are in a high risk, high consequence area, mimic a warship. Go out of bound. Opposition is good. Things have really heated up off the coast of Somalia. You also have no idea what's going to happen to your body because you're not in charge. You can be... I'm Ben. That's Ashley. Together, we did the unimaginable. We sold everything and then set off on a mission to sail around the world. Civilization. See you later. Fishing competition, man. I think I win. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. After 38 countries, over 40,000 nautical miles, and welcoming two kids along the way, we are on our second lap around the world. It's definitely harder cruising with kids, but it's really rewarding, and it's been a lot of fun having them along for the ride. And that's what this is all about. Meeting people, seeing beautiful places, and the beautiful world that we live in. Subscribe to follow the adventure as we live a life at sea. I have no idea what's gonna happen. Today's topic is a bit more serious. Uh, we've decided to do a little video about piracy at sea. I was just smiling away. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Is it funny? No, I just didn't know we were going to be that serious. It's just Ben and Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since we've done that too. It's been fun. a while since we've talked to the camera at this table. Table we, talks. We always do vlogs. They get old. I, I look forward to doing more how-tos. Let us know what you guys think about this video. I mean, if you guys like it, we'll make more. All right, so let's get serious now. Over the past decade, we've sailed to so many countries and we've had really amazing experiences and some that, you know, are also quite memorable. We visited so many countries and one of the topics that keeps coming up is piracy in our community and online. When you people think of piracy, to me at least, at least this is the way I used to be, I think about Captain Jack Sparrow. What are you doing? No, what are you doing? What are you doing? Who do you think about? Captain Phillips. Look at me, sure. Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. You like a boyfriend? So what is piracy? Piracy is the act of attacking and robbing ships at sea. And attacking, I mean, it's attacking the people, attacking the, content. the crew, the contents, and taking whatever they want, they're plundering. But it could be as simple as stealing an outboard or stealing a bathing suit off of your line. Do we really call that piracy or do we call that the wind? <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, you kind of get the drift. Piracy doesn't always have to be Captain Phillips or Captain Jack Sparrow. Piracy is sort of our basic day-to-day -day criminal activities that you encounter on land, but now on the sea. And that essentially is what we're here to talk about today is how we defend against criminal activities against us at sea. So we have decided to separate piracy or acts of piracy into two broad categories. The first one is kidnap for ransom. And the second category is everything lesser uh, of that. So lesser degree of criminal violence. And let's start with kidnap for ransom because that's a pretty serious offense. Um, and we hope to never be in that situation. 
I want to talk to you guys a little bit about our deciding factor about where we go often. What we look at is a risk versus consequence kind of dilemma. Is it high risk or low risk? Uh, and then consequences are like, is your dinghy engine going to get stolen or are you going to be kidnapped and held for ransom? So the way we cruise is we allow ourselves to kind of take go to areas that are high risk because lots of dinghy engines have been stolen and lots of, um, you know, small petty theft is occurring, still piracy, but we know that the consequences are very low. The opposite to the high risk, low consequence is low risk. It doesn't happen very often. For example, people are not kidnapped very often in Somalia. The last one has been a long time ago, but the consequences are so high that we do not want to even entertain the possibility that it could happen to us. So even though it's very unlikely, it's low risk that it would happen, the consequences of it happening are devastating. They're devastating to us, they're devastating to our family, they're devastating to our extended family usually because of the monetary effect that, you know, ransom demands can have on, on everyone you know. We're not dealing with, uh, with a reasonable group of people here. We're, we're dealing with an absolutely brutal uh, enemy. Abu Sayyaf has been active in the Philippines for decades. For years, they were aligned with Al-Qaeda, but more recently, they've pledged allegiance to ISIS. If you're taking hostage for ransom, it's not just it's not just like a few days you're inconvenienced. You can be held for days, months, years. You could be in very unsanitary conditions, in not a nice place where you're sick, you're, you're not healthy, your children are, are sick and unhealthy, somebody could die. You also have no idea what's gonna happen to your body because you're not in charge. You can be you know, held down and abused. Um, so there's a very high consequence um, although it's very unlikely to happen. Basically, our way of dealing with this is to not go to those areas. But there are some other ways that you can cruise through these areas that make it a little safer. The sponsor for today's video is Babbel. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world and it is the best way to learn a new language. Babbel teaches real world practical conversation and real life vocabulary for learning to speak the language that you choose. I chose French. Nous allons faire de la plongée et de la randonnée. Nous allons faire de la plongée et de la randonnée. Babbel has been so instrumental in helping me communicate here in French Polynesia and so important for helping us learn the local customs. Après couper des petits morceaux. Petits morceaux comme ça. He cuts small Un, pieces out of it. Deux, trois, quatre. C'est la pierre. He comme puts ça. the small pieces on the stone. Il y avait 37, 40, oui. euh, 25. Parce que des fois les poissons ils montent et des fois ils descendent. Yeah, so he has all different lengths. With summer travel upon us and with just 10 minutes a day, Babbel can help you speak like a local on your trip of a lifetime. Babbel is scientifically proven to help you start learning a new language in just three weeks. And since they have a 20 day money back guarantee, there is no reason not to get started right away. Click the link below to get 60% off your subscription and let me know in the comments what language you want to learn for your trip of a lifetime. Thank you so much Babbel for sponsoring today's video. So full disclaimer guys, this isn't a comprehensive list. We're basically looking what, what, uh, at what a typical circumnavigation might look like for, say, us as sailors. Please do your own research, make your own decisions about where you're gonna go and why, because your risk factor and our risk factor are sometimes completely different and you also might have completely different ideas after reading the reports. The other thing to note is a report is a report. You do not see all the amazing reports of an area, you only see the negatives. So keep that in mind because we have traveled to some areas that I would have hated to miss based on the fact that there is some risk for entering that area. When you're coming at Africa, you have to choose whether you're gonna go up through the Suez Canal or down underneath the bottom of Africa. If you end up going up through the Suez Canal, you're gonna be off the coast of Somalia and Yemen. Now, those areas have in recent times been pretty quiet for piracy, but in 2024, you have multiple reports of both hijackings, uh, boats being fired upon, attempted hide attacks, and actual boarding. So things have really heated up off the coast of Somalia. Many years ago, uh, before we started sailing, there was a couple that was kidnapped and held for ransom uh, just outside of the Seychelles. 
For Rachel and Paul Chandler, the adventure of a long-distance yacht cruise became an ordeal at the hands of Somali pirates. More than a year of captivity and long periods of separation when each was unsure about the fate of the other. If I was with my husband, I would feel a lot better. The Chandlers had been in the Seychelles and were heading for Tanzania. But in October 2009, their yacht was attacked and boarded by pirates. They were forced to sail toward the Somali coast. Uh, you're actually now restoring your yacht, as I understand it, Rachel, and preparing to set sail again. That, to most folks, uh, would be unthinkable. I think to people who are not sailors and not cruisers, it's probably unthinkable. But all our friends have really encouraged us to get back to our lives. And for us, getting back to normal is going back cruising again. We love sailing, we love traveling, we love meeting people. And that, for us, is the life we want to lead. Now, again, in, in what Ben's talking though, about, even though it has had a massive increase in 2024, there haven't been any attacks against private yachts yet. So it's all been against tankers. So people are still thinking that it's probably okay to go through on personal vessels. But I think the number, if you follow the groups, the number seems to be declining a bit. People are getting a little more nervous this year. Yeah. The second high consequence area that we've identified around the world is the Philippines, because a lot of sailors sometimes go to the Philippines. We did, we went to the Philippines. And a few years before we went, there was a hostage taking in Southern Palawan. Now the Sulu and Celebes Sea in the Southern Philippines is known to be an Abu Sayyaf uh, hotspot. Uh, there is uh, ongoing issues down there that always has been. And um, it is an area that we actively avoided. So when we came into the Philippines, we came up over the top of Papua New Guinea and entered the Philippines in the exact center. Went through the middle of the Philippines, past Cebu, and then over to Palawan, and then came right back out um, as uh, typhoon season was approaching and went way off uh, shore down to Indonesia, Raja Ampat. So we avoided the whole Sulu and Celebes Sea. We're in this, it's almost like the Gulf Stream. It's a huge current going down the coast of Mindanao and these guys are coming up beside us. There's a mothership way, you can't see it way off there. It's a tiny little boat. They're happy, they're waving, they're fishermen. We're gonna go pass them some Ritz crackers, some apples, and maybe some water. I don't know. That is absolutely nuts. Yeah, Southern Philippines has different fishing boats. Those are like, we call them the slipper boats. Others might head through an area that is known piracy, but then hire um, armed mercenaries, and you can do that. So there are pick up and drop off points for mercenaries that you can do to trans transit the areas off of Somalia and head up the Suez Canal. If you're doing that, you're making it a very quick passage and you are, you know, you've got extra crew on board, extra hands, and they are watching out for your safety and security. And that is, you know, to me, that reduces the risk heavily. And I, I think that's a great idea. Now, is it necessary? No idea, because you don't know until you need it. So mercenaries typically come on board as units of three and you pay per day. So they can range from anywhere from a few thousand to I don't know, well over $10,000 a day. Uh, they bring their weapons from a... The weapons know, are picked up offshore, offshore and then dropped off dropped offshore. offshore. To avoid local laws. Yeah, it, it, it is, I think, one of those situations where you're actually potentially have a fighting chance against the seriousness of these kind of hostage-taking pirates because they have AK-47s. They don't just, are, aren't just wielding machetes and, and handguns. You know, these are serious kind of pirates that, that mean business. Is that something we would do? I don't think so. I think anytime we would feel the need to have mercenaries aboard, we would reevaluate our routing and would probably route around that area. Which is what we did. There's also a ton of piracy, what they call piracy in the Malacca Straits. I remember transiting through the Malacca Straits. We went right up uh, from Indonesia up into 
Singapore. And if you look on the map, there is a ton of boardings right where we went through. And if you read the reports, they're all about uh, guys getting aboard freighters, tying up the crew, and then stealing spare parts or other valuable items off the freighter and then fleeing. And these are not hostage taking kind of piracy acts. They're just simply uh, taking advantage of this part of the Malacca Straits, which is a pinch point and where these freighters have to slow down because there's literally so much traffic around uh, Singapore that gives the pirates some um, an opportunity to get aboard. In conclusion, in terms of high consequence areas, we evaluate how many incidences have happened, uh, have they affected sailors, and then we look at our routing. Can we route around those areas? How can we mitigate these risks? Because at the end of the day, a lot of these most beautiful places in the world are sometimes in high risk areas. Uh, Papua New Guinea comes to mind. We, we have had some of the best cruising in Papua New Guinea. Was it high risk? Yeah. Was it high consequence? No, I wouldn't say so. Yeah, I didn't. I wouldn't even know if it was high risk. Like I would even sort of argue there because you're out in these little islands in the Louisiades, and it's an area that is not known for acts of piracy. Yeah. So I think it's fine. And then I brought some rice and some sugar. And do you need washing powder? No, 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 machine powder. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that too. <laughs> but next, what we want to talk about, which is what we do travel through, uh, and basically, everywhere you go, everywhere you live, every city basically in the world, every little bay has the potential for piracy. And it can be something as silly as, you know, uh, a gas line taken from your dinghy or something as serious as um, you being murdered on your boat um, while they steal your possessions. Let's let's jump into our experience. So we had a boarding in the Seychelles. You remember that? I do. It's so, something you don't forget very quickly, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> it's our first and hopefully only uh, boarding that we will ever have. It happened at 2 a.m. in the morning. We were well asleep. Oh man, I heard the alarm go off. Didn't steal anything. Got my scuba tanks out, didn't get that, didn't get the paddleboard. Didn't get my ropes, didn't get that paddleboard. I bet you they're after the dinghy to be honest. Just coming off, there's a beach right there, and they're just coming off the beach. That's what they're trying to do. I, I've trained this in my head so many times. I heard the alarm go off, this is the alarm. And I thought it was a false alarm. Yeah, I thought it was a false alarm too. So I stick my head up over here because I always look up first to see if, you know, they have a gun or something. I see them right there in the corner. I go, it's like a split second decision to go at them. I rip open the door, I go, rip open the door, Wah! what are you doing? <laughs> and then I hear splash, splash. And then I shine my flashlight over there. It's like the Rastafarians with their you know, Bob Marley hats all soaking wet, trying to get back into their kayak. Like, I don't know even what they're saying, what they were saying, Ash. You're out by yeah. then. You're out there on deck naked. He said they didn't take anything, man. They didn't get anything, man. So I think they were coming for things, obviously, but they didn't get it. After that incident in the Seychelles where those guys came aboard, I gave some pause and thought of what I would have liked to have had in hand or as backup. Uh, if those guys had persisted and tried to come at me. Well, the first thing that I've always had aboard is this. This is simply a driveway alarm. And these are infrared uh, sensors, which I can place all over the boat. We've been in places where I've had them up front, on the sides, in the cockpit, down the steps. I have many of these. And they all, this alarm sits beside me, uh, right at my head uh, while I'm sleeping down below and alerts me if anything is going on. They're not foolproof because if it's a full moon, these will get triggered and you'll be up all night checking for false alarms. The second thing that I have aboard is a really powerful flashlight. This is uh, 
uh, flashlight called Nebo from uh, given to us by Indie Marine. Indie Marine is a great little shop um, in the US. If, if you want anything, I'll put the link in the description below. But it is a powerful flashlight that not only has a strong beam, but also a strobe. A strobe that is very disorientating to any intruder. Also quite heavy. Third thing something you can fight back with. This is a club, but not only a club, but also the taser. I don't think Bodhi's ever seen it. Having something audible to the intruder might give them more pause. So I think a taser is a great option, not legal in every country, but definitely a less lethal item that might stop them. Uh, something else that lives around our boat, mace. We have small cans of mace. We have right cans of mace. I don't know if mace is a great idea on a boat. The wind is always swirling. If you were to look at the wind pattern here in this cockpit, it's probably going around in circles. So if you start spraying mace, you're probably gonna mace yourself as well. But in a worst case situation, maybe it'll immobilize or demobilize. Immobilize? Stop everyone from doing what they're doing. Um, Big cans of mace, you know, this is nice and cute inside in a confined space, but if you're actually outside and you have a banker with 15 guys coming up to you, you might want to bring out the right can of mace to spray it downwind at them, and it might give them pause. Finally, an air horn or something that will alert your neighbors. You are often anchored in anchorages with many boats around you, sometimes hundreds of boats, but very few boats will wake up in the middle of the night if one boat needs attention. In the Seychelles, we tried to alert our neighbors. We couldn't, we couldn't raise them, we couldn't wake them. We tried flashing our flashlights at them. They wouldn't wake up. I wouldn't wake up if someone flashed a flashlight on the outside of my boat. So an air horn, um, some sort of loud device, a siren that will wake up the whole anchorage if you need help. Because again, once they come inside, you are in a world of hurt. You're gonna be possibly tied up. It'll take hours for them to ransack your boat. Even if you're able to take this and go downstairs, blow it out through a little porthole, it'll give them pause and might cause them to run away. One thing you'll notice is we don't have anything resembling a gun. Guns are complicated. There's different rules. We've been to places where they thought a spear gun was a real gun. So we got the Coast Guard here in the Maldives and they're trying to take away my spear gun from Indonesia. It doesn't really work. We just actually disabled it, we cut it, and uh, now they're trying to take it away from us. If you are a gun person, and I completely understand if you are, you're gonna have to research the countries that you're going to or not go to those countries because each country is gonna have a different rule. Typically they'll confiscate your gun or take it into custody on your port of arrival. Then you will sail through that country for weeks or months and you'll have to go back to that port of arrival to collect your gun. Sometimes you can ship it in bond. Sometimes you can keep that gun in a safe that is then secured and locked and bonded on your boat. Uh, sometimes you can't. Some countries won't allow you to have a gun. Some countries have the death penalty if you have a gun aboard. Uh, Singapore, Malaysia come to mind, Indonesia. Some countries are very, very strict when it comes to guns. There's a couple other things that are sometimes just part of a normal boat equipment list, and we're gonna test those out to see if those are possible means of defending yourself against pirate. Fire extinguishers. Maybe if you're inside the boat, someone is cornering you, you got a fire extinguisher probably in every room. Try pointing it and pulling the trigger. It might work. Flares. There's different kinds of flares. You got your parachute flare, you got your handheld flare, and then you got your smoke flare. And people have tested these out. We're gonna test these out on land in a bit here. Um, we had a moment in Sri Lanka, off the coast of Sri Lanka, where the Sri Lankan fishing boats would come at us. And they came at us not in a calm manner. They would cut us off. They come right in front of our bow to slow us down. And 
then they would want to trade. We didn't know that at the time, but it kind of gave me pause to think about what would I do if someone followed me offshore for hours and hours and hours? Like, how could I dissuade them? And I have a few ideas. One was a laser, a rescue laser. So I picked up a rescue laser and a laser, you can shoot at someone, a boat coming behind you say, to kind of show, I know you're there. I know you're following me and you know, maybe this is a rescue laser, but maybe it's a rescue laser mounted on a firearm. It'll light up the whole boat and I'll give them pause to think, huh, what are they pointing a laser at me for? And what do they have aboard that might be of not good health benefits for me? Your kitchen knives are also weapons, and every weapon that you have out in the open on your boat can also be used against you. We heard a story in Papua New Guinea where uh, in caving, which is an area that has had a few problems, um, security problems, a woman had been attacked with her own kitchen knife. Um, and that is, that's a scary reality. Keep in mind that anything that you have out could be used against you as a weapon as well. So Ashley's gonna laugh at me for this one, but I actually have it on my phone. And that is the scene of Captain Phillips mim mimicking a warship as he's being followed by pirates. So the idea is you take that clip from that video and play it over your VHF. Coalition Warship 237, this is Mask Alabama. Coalition Warship 237, Mask Alabama. Go Alabama. Our position is... We require immediate assistance. Copy, uh, Alabama. Beware, gunship is in the air. ETA uh, position, uh, five minutes. Five minutes, thank you, 237. If you are in a high risk, high consequence area, and you could mimic a warship coming to your aid, and the pirates are also listening to the VHF, a lot of variables there you might be able to dissuade them from attacking you. So that's kind of my last line of defense if everything goes sideways. What do you think, Ash? You showed me it before. The funny thing is, is like they're playing like dun -dun 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 music in the background. It's never going to work. But the radio is a good tool 100% because we have had friends that have just called other other boats in the anchorage on the radio and luckily someone was um, listening or even other boats in the general vicinity and someone was listening make sure your radio works guys because we've lately seen a few people that their radios aren't going very far uh, and we've even had to relay recently um, a radio thing so anyway um, yes radios can be your friend as well and if you really feel the need you could imitate a warship just because there's a lot of boats in an anchorage doesn't mean it's safer than being anchored all by yourself in the South Pacific or Papua New Guinea. It just because there's a lot of boats does not indicate a level of safety whatsoever. And we saw that this year, unfortunately, in the Caribbean once again, um, where there was a tragic event that happened in Grenada and in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So. Um, stay informed, get your information, make informed decisions, and enjoy this life. I think, again, from all the reports that are out there, like Ashley said at the beginning, there are hundreds of thousands of reports that are not made of how awesome it is out here. So it is actually quite safe out here, and we have hermit crabs as pets. These hermit crabs need to be filing reports against us, I think. <laughs> I see it, yeah. So let me introduce you to Snaggletooth, the Nehoa pirate. He is coming to attack us, and uh, we're going to try and deter him from attacking us with flares. Now, we've never shot a flare. We've shot flares before, but never at a pirate or sideways. Usually hold them up and shoot them straight to the air. So we have no idea what's going to happen. Behind us, all it is is beach and dead stuff, so we're good. But I am a little bit worried about a rebound. So what happens if Snaggletooth, the flare bounces off Snaggletooth and, and lands back at, at us? There is a video of a guy shooting a flare gun. We don't actually have a flare gun on board Nahoa, but if you check the link below, there's a guy who has tested how effective flare guns would actually be in self-defense. And it is shockingly bad. Like not useful at all. So before you suggest that we use a flare gun, go check out that video.
So these are these are uh, parachute flares, signal rocket flares. These are, you fire them up into the sky. They go way up high. They make a bunch of noise, and then they go pop and float down with the flare and a parachute above them. Um, the idea here is to shoot them at a pirate ship coming at you, and then the second objective is to see if we can cause any damage. Directions: hold firmly by ribbed handle, okay, and unscrew cap. Do not point at people. Uh oh, do not point at pirates. Hold rocket vertically above head, point away from ball. Ensure. And then you pull. Okay, we can do this. Yes, I read most of the instructions. <laughs> Straight behind Data, okay? That way he blocks us. If it bounces and hits him, it bounces and hits him. I'm gonna aim it looking down the barrel. Ready? Yep. Is that scary? Uh, you're supposed to hold it like away from your body so then like it blasts towards the ground so probably not the best thing to aim in front of your eyes but uh, <laughs> I, I haven't hit the pirate, the pirate's still coming at me not effective as far as it's I'm scary concerned. scary as hell though. <laughs> This is a close combat test. You might be able to use a hand flare. <laughs> close combat flare, you might be able to jab it into them. It's pretty know. hot, man. Dude, this is super hot. I've started a bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> Every single night we pull up our dinghy. And the reason for that is because one, uh, if a squall comes, we want to be ready and have all of the toys, dinghies, lines out of the water so nothing can get caught in the props. And two is for security. Um, these dinghies and outboards are worth a lot of money like well over five thousand dollars us and the outboards especially ours like the two stroke are very highly sought after if you look at all the cruising reports from some of the areas in the caribbean you see a lot of dinghy theft and i'm sure some of that's real but i'm sure a lot of that's also just people not tying up the dinghies after having a good time on at the bar personally i have mistied our dinghy twice. It both happened in Vanuatu and we lost it. Uh, luckily found it again, but it was lost for a few hours. They're hard to find. They'll drift down, they'll go up mangroves, so, you know, you never think where they are. The other thing you'll notice is it's bright in here and it's always bright on the inside of a boat. Even if it's not super bright, it's still brighter than the pitch black out there. Like if I look out there, it's pitch black. I cannot see anyone out there. Yeah, they can see everything inside. We've had we've had multiple occasions where we're anchored in some place and there's local fishermen fishing around us and it it's totally fine. They're just catching their fish for dinner, but they're able to see everything and we're not able to see anything. One thing you can do is turn on your radar. If you have a good radar, you can turn it on and zoom in as close as you can and then you can see uh, the local fishing boats around if there are any or any you know boats that shouldn't be there that 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 are kind of like just hanging out a little bit too close um, that's one little trick i've used uh recently actually um to to kind of keep an eye on a local fishing boat that was just fishing a little bit too close at night it turned out he was literally just working the fish under our boat because we had lights on and it attracted all the bait fish in. So most of the time, 99.999% of the time, it is literally just a fisherman. I think the one thing we want to say is it's really pretty safe out here and piracy doesn't really affect our cruising plans much for the most part. Um, we do take 
simple precautions, a sensor alarm, we lock our dinghy, we raise our dinghy every night. And we lock our doors. Yes. <laughs> so with those simple precautions, we've been able to stay safe. We've been able to ward off intruders and we've doubled down on our weapons to convince them to not come any further aboard. Security is always something we are thinking about. Uh, safety, piracy, keeping your family and your home safe and thieves away, keeping your dinghy safe. It's just like the sharks, guys. In French Polynesia, they're everywhere. Uh, you must watch out for them and have respect for them. The chances of it happening to you are very slim. There are hundreds and hundreds of people out cruising and not that many actual reported incidences uh, compared to the number of cruising people. So get out there, enjoy life, and you know, maybe have a sensor alarm, an air horn, and say hi to your neighbors so they know you're out there. Stay safe out there and then you get to enjoy places like this where really the only people that we have to worry about are our sharky friends and they are wonderful neighbors. <laughs>